You can probably notice from my accent that I'm not European. And um, I want to make a deal with y'all. I will not ask about Brexit if you promise not to ask about our current president. Does that, does that seem fair? Because I can guarantee you I want to talk about that less than you guys want to talk about Brexit. All right. Cool. Well, um, to give you a quick background on myself, uh, I started my career in the US Air Force as a civilian intelligence analyst. And while I was not in the military, I had the privilege and honor of working alongside the men and women who wore the uniform. And while I was there, I focused on first foreign computer networks, understanding how our adversaries would leverage them during times of war for command and control. And then I shifted my focus to foreign malware analysis. So really digging into how our adversaries were taking these new cyber capabilities and what they would do to leverage them, specifically against air and space systems. Uh, when I left the government, I joined a small telecommunications provider named Cincinnati Bell, and I was on a team that built up their first threat intelligence program. I focused on network intelligence, so architecting our network security, monitoring, uh, developing signatures, indicator management, that sort of work. Uh, this led me over to FireEye, where I joined a really small team that built out what was at the time the world's largest network security monitoring grid. Our team of five people built and maintained over 2,000 sensors. And I'm really proud of that project. It was an amazing accomplishment and something even to this day I'm just so thankful for. Uh, when I finished up at FireEye, I came over here to Anomaly. And I first started off in professional services. So I talked to our customers. And I learned about their threat intelligence programs, where they stood in terms of maturity, what they were capable of doing, and where they wanted to go. Because my hope was to work with them to leverage our products and our platforms to really grow their programs. So again, thank you for coming to this conference. You know, conferences like this, they're not just a chance to get out of the office and enjoy a beautiful destination like Monaco, even though it is, it's really pretty here. It's my first time. Um, but it's here when we are amongst our peers and we're away from our screens where we can listen to each other, we can learn from each other, and we can share. In the threat intelligence community, we talk a lot about sharing. But usually we mean sharing indicators of compromise. Things like IP addresses, domains, emails, and hashes. That level of sharing is good and it's necessary, but it's not enough. We're made better by the sharing of our experiences. The lessons that we learn during an incident, our successes and our failures, and oftentimes the littlest things that make the biggest impact. Because when we get to this level of sharing, beyond just the technical or the superficial, what we're doing is we're giving the community a chance to grow and learn from our mistakes. So my hope today is that I will share with you some of my experiences, things that I learned most often the hard way, and that you'll be able to walk away with maybe some ideas or some questions that you can take back to your organization. Well, the original title for this talk was called Moving Beyond IOCs, Why Detecting Behaviors is Where It's At. But as I worked on the presentation, I realized that didn't actually cover what I wanted to talk about. You know, it's, it was a neat sounding title, but it didn't grasp the history of, of where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are today. So our attackers keep evolving. They're driven to uncover new ways to make money and profit from the ever-changing technology landscape. And so we as defenders need to make sure we're keeping pace. So I want to take you back to college for me. Uh, I was studying computer science. Uh, my very first college internship was with a human resources consulting firm. And my first task was upgrading from Novell Netware to Outlook. Now, I don't know how many Novell Netware fans there are here, and I don't want to insult you. <laughs> but uh, I remember it being just a massive upgrade. Like, it, it felt so, so much newer and so much better. And so I learned things like IT administration, imaging computers with Norton Ghost. That was not fun. Um, you know, interacting with users configuring software, networking. But I actually didn't learn a lot about security. And so it happened that my very first security incident was during this internship. And it started like many of them do. We got a call from a user, hey, my computer's running slow. I'm having issues accessing a file server. Uh, you know, you don't think too much about it with one user. Server's probably under heavy load, you know, whatever. But we got more calls from more users. And then we started to experience the same slowdown. So we went out, did a little digging, and uncovered that a few hosts were just really blasting communication across the network. So we did some packet capture, looked at the hosts, and uh, we had a worm trying to rip through the network. 
And it actually was Sasser. This was right around the time that Sasser was making itself known. I don't know if any of you remember this beautiful error screen, joy of Windows XP, but uh, I do, because it was a very, very long day and an even longer night. We had to go to each machine individually, disconnect it from the network, manually apply the Microsoft patch and AV updates, reboot, and then reconnect to the network for every single box. And then when we were all done, we had to scan the network to make sure that there weren't any hosts that we missed. Well, it was a pretty tough problem. I'm actually really lucky that that was my first security incident. Because even though it was a lot of chaos, we had impact to operations and you know, overtime hours, we didn't have any kind of concern about an adversary behind it. Sure, there was someone who wrote the worm, you know, and their goal was to cause chaos, but we didn't see any exfiltration, command and control, encryption, or anything like that. So it was just a simple worm. And for me, this really opened my eyes to security. Because here, you know, I saw that patching was really important. And even to this day, we're not really doing that very well. Um, updating AV and configuring firewalls, like all the importance of the simple security things that even then we were just starting to understand. And so this attack wasn't really driven by any financial means that we saw. You know, you had attackers doing these things for the lulls, right? I can get it done, I can take advantage of a system, so I'm gonna do it because I can. But we didn't see much in terms of like trying to profit from it. It was just a simple worm. So, sorry, I get dry mouth a lot, so I gotta drink water. Well, my first real interaction with a human adversary actually occurred when I was in graduate school. So I was studying to get my master's in international affairs, and I focused on security studies. I wanted to get into the intelligence community. And this program was kind of like a pipeline for that. So I had the opportunity to take the curriculum's very first cyber-based course. And our professor was involved in an organization within Pittsburgh that researched criminal activity and how it was leveraging the internet and, and darker portions of the web to get things done. And as a research student, this was really exciting. We were going on, and, and <laughs> this is a little crazy, but we actually went onto the forums and started to dig into the personas and understand how they were operating, the things that they were doing, where they were lurking. And um, we did leverage the computers and the unattributed network connection of this organization. But even now looking back, that probably wasn't the smartest idea because these were criminals. You know, we were actually digging into how they were operating. And we didn't really think about the consequences though. Like this was so new and so exciting. It, for me, it was just like a great opportunity to really understand how they were doing things. And um, this was actually during the, the, heyday, the heyday of the Russian business network and a lot of these early Carter forums. And so it was really cool to, to dig into that and understand you know, how this, this human, now there's a human behind this attack. What are they doing? How are they profiting from it? What are they talking about? And so it was actually during this time where you saw some of the bigger breaches start to be announced. Things like the Card System Solutions hack, um, the infamous TJ Maxx breach, and the Heartland Payment Systems breach, where you had 100 million or more records stolen by the criminals. Things like user information and credit cards. And they were being sliced up and bundled and sold on these forums. And we were kind of digging into how they were profiting from it. And it was so really cool. But what I noticed during this time was that there, there was not a lot of talk around IOCs or, or the technology, right? A lot of the research focused on the users, the people. Now, granted, law enforcement, they were involved. You know, they, they were doing their forensics and, and getting this information. But from what I could tell, it was kept close to the chest because they wanted to use it for criminal cases and court activity. And they didn't want the evidence to get out and cause any potential conflict. And so during this time, for me, the biggest takeaway was, was the human adversary. Again, my first incident was a piece of code, something that caused problems. But now I was seeing that there's someone behind there. These attackers who started out doing things for fun or because they could or just to cause chaos were recognizing that, hey, this information I've gotten a hold of, I can profit from it. I can make money off of this. And so there was a shift in awareness in a way that I had not really recognized at first is that the humans were finding that this was a way to do things, to make money, to get rich. And <laughs> initially you saw spreadsheets being tossed around for research and domains for forums, but that was it. 
it, it wasn't really, there still wasn't a lot of talk about defense or security. It was, hey, how are these people doing these things? So, sorry, too soon. Um, up until this point, I actually hadn't entered the workforce really. So, um, I started my career with the Air Force. And I had a great opportunity to really understand intelligence analysis and tradecraft, learn about these adversaries that I had encountered. What was their intent? What were their capabilities? And, and researching them. And, and proper analytical tradecraft. It was actually during this time where the government was starting to throw money at organizations to build up their cyber talent. You know, and, and every organization wanted to get a piece of that, that funding. But as, a, as an employee of the US Air Force, we were air, space, and cyberspace. So thankfully, we had an explicit mission that cyberspace was our domain. And so I started off, as I said, researching our adversaries and how they were using these new technologies. Things like computer networks, um, command and control, malware analysis. It was a great opportunity. And I got to dig into not just the technical piece, but you know, really understand human intent and capability and how they could leverage that. And these experiences, they really shaped how I would view threat intelligence going forward. You know, it, it prepared me for what it might look like in the private sector. And during this time, you saw things like Operation Aurora, where an entity in China went after Google. Um, the RSA breach. You know, David talked, about, talked to us on Wednesday night about encryption and how important it is and how it underpins our our trust in, in the confidentiality and the integrity and the authenticity of the information that we, that we share with each other. And you saw at this RSA breach, they didn't just target RSA, they targeted the secure ID platform because RSA was not the end state. It was a stepping stone to target a customer of theirs who leveraged this platform, who relied on the trust and the security inherent to that secure ID platform and it was so complex, and it was so unique, and you really saw strategy and thought and patience behind these attacks. And then you had, you know, PLA, Military Unit Cover Designator 61398, also known as Comet Crew or Comet Panda, and the report from Mandian that showed how you could take indicators of compromise and combine it with intelligence analysis to come to some sort of attribution. Well, this for me was really the, the foundation of threat intelligence. I worked with our single source collectors, our network defenders, and you know, the folks in the reporting community to really dig into how we, and when I say we, I mean the US government and the military, how we were able to take this information and attribute attacks, not just to countries, but to individual units within those countries. This was cyber threat intelligence in its earliest stages. You know, the government was the first target of these big advanced style attacks. And out of necessity, they recognize that for them to keep up, the point of intelligence is to be proactive, not reactive. And so they had to take cyber and all of this new technology and build it into the intelligence framework. And, out, and the framework was great. The military and the government have a, has a great process around intelligence analysis. So cyber became just another aspect of it. Yes, you need to understand the technology. You need to understand how the adversaries are going to use that. But it was just another piece of the system, and it worked very, very well. So when I left the government, I really took with me this greater understanding of how our adversary had evolved. You know, again, financial short-term gain now shifting into longer-term plans, bigger strategy. These, the attackers were more patient. They were much better funded. And out of that, you saw complex tool sets being developed, things to target organizations and hit at the encryption, the very security tools that they used. You saw command and control over hacked infrastructure and leveraging things like proxies to hide their activity. What it did was it underscored to me that, again, the landscape was shifting and dramatically. And so being a blue team person and a defender, I realized we had to keep up. And I didn't really understand like, how important cyber threat intelligence was to the private sector yet. It was still new. Like, I knew what it meant for the government. And I had this, this concept in my mind of what IOCs were to be used for and how we would do threat intelligence. But I was going to learn that it was very, very different when you go into the private sector space. Is that right? Yeah, sorry. 
Well, that kind of brings us to now, if you will, or what I like to call the now. Uh, cyber threat intelligence, it's common vernacular. Every large organization, well-funded security team knows about cyber threat intelligence. They know the need for IOCs, the importance of sharing, getting that information out. We're seeing the discovery of more and more IOCs, and that's great because we're getting it shared across more quickly. Um, and actually, if you take a step back, this sharing platforms that we have now actually stem from the defense industrial base. So the government was the first target of these APT attacks. And having an intelligence community in place, the ability to share was, I won't say easy, but easier because everyone had the same systems and the clearances. But then you had the APT attacks shift and move towards the contractors, you know, the next soft target. And the, 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 the DIB did not have the communication channels in place. So they stood up a forum where members of each organization could get involved and share their incidents, share what they were seeing. And you see this mirrored in the things like the Intelligence Sharing and Analysis Centers, or ISACs, where within each sector or each vertical, you have an ISAC dedicated to that industry for member organizations to get involved and share. But not just formal sharing. Um, as someone in the community, my peers and my coworkers and my colleagues, we recognized that even if there wasn't a formal sharing partnership in place, we needed to make sure this information was getting passed around. So you saw Google groups, email threads, dedicated to specific types of attacks where we could jump in and say, hey, you know, guys, take a look, take a look for this. You know, we saw this incident. You know, make sure you're, you're looking for these indicators. But as more and more indicators were discovered, these sharing platforms were starting to fall behind. It became infeasible to take thousands of IOCs and share them in an email or in a spreadsheet or in a forum. And so you had the birth of threat intelligence platforms. And this was really, really good too, because now not just the big guys, not just the large organizations with a lot of funding, but the smaller teams could get involved in this level of sharing. These platforms brought with them automation around ingesting, correlating, and deduplicating these IOCs. And so the smaller organizations were able to jump into sharing and immediately benefit from it. Well, there's also some downside to that. Because with the massive increase in IOCs and the smaller teams now being able to get access to them, what inevitably happened was they were dumping them right into their tools, right into their platforms, and getting overwhelmed with the amount of alerts generated. You know, alert fatigue is, is such a real thing. And the massive amount of IOCs just contribute to that. These security teams were, were overwhelmed. And not just alert fatigue, but the increase in false positives. Because when you get external information from your orgs, like your partner orgs, what it means to them in the context in their environment may not be the same as to what's in your environment. And so you saw these folks struggling with, how do I close this ticket? Because I'm not sure what the context is around this alert. And threat intelligence, we use IOCs for attribution, for research and analysis. And then you've got your SOC guys using it for defense. And so many times I'll go into an organization and those two teams are separated, either physically, administratively, or organizationally. And that separation causes miscommunication and a lack of understanding because the SOC just does not know what the context is or what this threat intelligence means. And they need to talk to the intel analysts who maybe aren't able to talk to them or don't have the time or that communication is not facilitated. And so this information that we're getting, this data, is increasing. But our ability to, to keep up with it and to scale with it is falling behind. But our attackers are still evolving. Right? They, they haven't stopped to wait for us to catch up. They recognize that IOCs are a core competency for many organizations and their defensive strategies. So what are they doing? Well, they're leveraging things like fileless malware or self-compiling malware, where it may not have to touch the disk, or if it does touch disk, it's gonna compile itself differently. So now those hashes, they're less useful. Or how many people use GitHub at work or allow their users to go to things like Twitter? The attackers know that that's something we do, and so they plant their command and control channels in legitimate services, or they'll compromise legitimate websites for exfiltration. Things like FastFlux DNS, uh, domain generating algorithms, they create massive pools of potential domains for C2 and for exploit delivery. 
And defenders can't possibly come up with all those domains, let alone look for them or alert on them. And then you have this new thing, newer thing called living off the land, where the attacker grabs a foothold on a platform and leverages the tools and the resources on that system to go about their business. They obfuscate their activity looking like an administrator, knowing that defenders can't use artifacts from that effectively because those artifacts exist on every single platform that runs that operating system. Well, we've seen it, and we continue to see it. Attackers are finding not only new ways to go after us, but ways to profit from non-traditional information. You know, ransomware, paying of ransom via cryptocurrency, stealing things like health records and credit histories. The attackers are, are evolving not just in their attacks, but in ways to profit. Well, if what we're doing isn't working, if we have these millions of IOCs and we're putting them in our systems, and yet the attackers continue to win, you know, why do we keep doing it? I mentioned before the attackers know our behaviors. I want to think about that for one minute. Picture in your mind an exploit developer or a malware author who sits down at his computer to write a piece of, of code. He knows that on the other side of the fence is a defender who's going to try and tear that binary apart, figure out how it operates and what it does. So what does that, that malware author do? They build in anti-debugging techniques, anti-analysis techniques, things to check if the implant is running in a VM, and sleep timers, all because they recognize the behaviors of a reverse engineer, and they try to use that against them. So if our adversaries are learning about us and how we operate, it would benefit us to do the same, to think about how they're operating and what we can do to use that. Well, I hope you don't think I'm trying to spread like fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because I'm not. Um, but I'm also not going to tell you that there's a magic box or a silver bullet that's going to solve all your problems, because such a thing, I don't think it exists. And I'm also not saying that IOCs are dead. I know some people think that, or some people might find that controversial. For me, they still have a very core part of every threat intelligence program. They're the foundation for your research, for your analysis, when you're trying to link campaigns to adversaries. And for those organizations who are just getting started in threat intelligence, IOCs are often going to provide them the greatest return on investment in the shortest amount of time. But our adversaries are maturing. We need to make sure that we do as well. And if they're learning from our behaviors and adapting, I think, again, it benefits us to do the same. And so I want to take a minute. And we know that we as humans, we love patterns and routines, right? We're a bit lazy. You know, as a, as a computer person, I would much rather write a script than do anything automated or do anything manually, right? The automation makes my life so much easier. And, and as, a, as a human, we've evolved and adapted to look for patterns because it improves our ability for survival. In, in the collection of food or in just in terms of like safety, patterns help us shortcut the thought process so that we can respond faster. But that's something that's exploitable. I mean, we're here in Monaco. You've got beautiful casinos that, according to the empty seats, I'm sure many of our colleagues enjoyed. Um, but when you walk in there and you approach a roulette table, They've got this board next to the table, right, with all the slots on the wheel and the recent activity. Well, we know that each spin of the wheel is a new series. It's a random event. Every event is disconnected. Granted, there's probability involved with each one, but they're not connected in any way. It's, it's a series of, of chaotic events. So why is that board there? Because when you as a human walk up to the table and you look at that board, the first thing your mind does is search for a pattern. It's search for order. You want something to pull out of there and, and make sense of all these chaotic events. And the casino knows that. So you look at that board and you think, hmm, 15 hasn't hit in a while. It might be due. But that's not logical. It's not rational. You know, we don't want to think about the probability every time the wheel spins. We just want a pattern. Well, attackers are human. They, too, are subject to the comfort of pattern and routine and order. When they go about their operations, when they get an, a foothold on a system inside an organization, they take a series of steps, things that they're comfortable with. It might be commands that they issue. It might be tools that they leverage. 
But they know that if it's worked before, it's probably going to work again. They don't have to think up new techniques or new attacks. They can use the same stuff. And we can take advantage of that. Um, within threat intelligence, we kind of are already doing that. You know, we, we often look at attacks and we look for not just the artifacts, but the behaviors of the attack because we can then attribute it. So take a group like Fin7. They're known to target retail and point of sale systems. Well, if you look at the reporting on Fin7, they, they use a tool called Carbonac. And there are a couple techniques that they leverage to ensure that Carbonac is installed on the system. And so when we do our analysis of incidents and we see Carbonac and we see those techniques used to install it, we can attribute that along with the artifacts of the attack and, and make a pretty bold claim that this is this group, Fin7. So if we're already doing that, I think it, it benefits us to look into doing that for defense as well and evolving our defenses to keep pace. But first, it's really difficult. Um, collecting the data necessary to do that is not easy. Uh, being a network guy, I love network monitoring. And when we do that, we're just looking for communication on the network. So it's easy for me to drop a box you know, at the ingress egress point of the network, set it in passive mode, and just listen for things. But when we want to detect behaviors, we're going to have to go to the endpoint because that's where the attacker lives and conducts most of their activity. And operating systems are very, very noisy. They generate a lot of events, a lot of logs. And on top of that, you've got applications installed on that system that are also generating their own sets of logs. So understanding what logs you need to pull from the system, what events you need, and the information around those events it's not an easy task. It requires a lot of tooling and, and a pretty robust platform. And then secondly, getting a solid understanding of the techniques employed and what they're going to look like on that targeted system. So when an attacker tries to achieve a tactic using a technique, what is that going to look like? What events will that generate? That's also not very easy to do. Well, thankfully, we're moving in the right direction. To, to address the first problem, uh, things like endpoint detection and response tools make it so much easier to get the right process metadata and, and bring it to a place where you can correlate it and start to do some detection and, and some searches. Things like Sysmon will generate the proper events that you need to go and search for attacker behavior. And to address the second problem, there's a framework that was created to map the tactics and techniques to the targeted systems. So I'm not sure if you're all aware of what's called the MITRE ATT&CK framework. ATT&CK stands for Adversary Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. This framework was built with a defender in mind because it allows us to have a, a common language, a common library where we can discuss attacker, attacker tactics and techniques, what they're doing, how they operate. But it doesn't stop there. It does so for each targeted platform. So there's a matrix for Windows for Linux, for Mac, for mobile computing. And um, I was talking to someone in the project a few weeks ago. They're working on a cloud one as well. So identifying where the attacker actually conducts their activity and then how we look for those techniques. And it goes one step further by taking threat intelligence and correlating it to those things. So now you can say, I know that this adversary tries to achieve this tactic with this specific technique. And this is awesome. What is it going to do for you, right? As an Intel analyst, I love the question, so what? That's a great question. So what? Well, first, it's going to foster collaboration. Your red team pen testers, your blue team defenders, and your threat intelligence analysts can now work together with a common vernacular. There's this concept of, of purple teaming, where your red team conducts a pen test, and your blue team tries to watch and catch them. The MITRE ATT&CK framework supports this activity explicitly by allowing us to create intelligence-driven scenarios that look like real-world attacks that our adversaries would actually conduct. So your red team can go out and simulate actual adversary attacks. And that allows your blue team to kind of be battle-tested, if you will, against the things they should see in the real world. And then afterwards, they can sit down in a hot wash and say, OK, red team, where did you get in? Here's where we caught you. Did we miss you anywhere? And what that does is that leads us to a second benefit of this framework, which is the ability to map our defensive controls. So by sitting down in a hot wash with your red team and your blue team and your threat intel folks, you can say, OK, 
We know the adversary operates this way. We've mimicked their behavior. Here's where we caught them, but we have some visibility gaps. Here are the systems that are vulnerable to the specific techniques that we don't have visibility into. What are we gonna do? Are we, we can start to take risk-based decisions. Well, we can patch these, we can monitor these, we know we can't do anything about these, we're gonna have to accept that risk. And then you can map tools and, and then spend efficiently. Define a, a requirement for a tool that's gonna provide the greatest visibility coverage across your gaps so that you buy the right tool the first time. Well, lastly, Using this framework is gonna facilitate the sharing of experiences. Going back to what I said in the very beginning. We need to share our experiences. We need to work together. And this framework is gonna allow us to do so in a much more you know, easy technical manner. By, by talking about the incidents we face, the attackers behind them, we can share specific techniques for everyone in the community to then go and look for. This creates a common language for everybody. Well, this is just another method for improving defenses. It's not the end state. The MITRE ATT&CK framework, like I said, it's not gonna solve all your problems. But what it does is it gives us another tool in our arsenal. We still need to do the foundational things well. Proper, prioritized, risk-based patching. Multi-factor authentication. User awareness training. All these things create a foundation for us. But then, once that foundation is strong, we can start to look at where we want to go. Identify where we are, where we want to be. And this is where sharing and working together is really important. Because go out into the community. Come to conferences like this. Ask your, ask your fellows, where are you in your, in your growth process? What are you working on? Because I can guarantee you that there's someone out there who's a little more mature than you and who can help you avoid pitfalls. And I also guarantee you that there's somebody out there who's less mature than you. You might not think so. You might not think that you have anything to share. But your insights and your experiences are unique to you, and somebody else may be able to learn from them. So be willing to share. I was at a conference last month, and it was so encouraging for me because I sat at a lunch table with a few practitioners, and, and a couple folks were talking, and the one person said, you know, we're looking to buy a new tool. We need an EDR solution. And we've got, you know, any named brands X and Y. You know, we've got them ready for POC. And another guy across the table said, hey, we've already done that. You, you can do X, Y, and Z when you're doing your POC, and it's going to make it that much more valuable. Look out for this. Uh, this tool was better in this regard, but this tool actually did better in this other section. And they were just sharing. And, and it was going to make that younger organization who looking for the tool, it was going to make their POC so much more valuable and help them make a better decision. Because, as I said in the very beginning, we have to grow as a community. We have to work together. Because it's not just for us, it's not enough for us to evolve as defenders on our own. We really need to evolve together if we're going to have any chance of stopping the adversary. So that's all I have. Do you ever see a scenario or a situation where we will be able to eradicate this malice? One. And the second thing, I know perhaps the reasons why you did patch, but there is also a military element of these cyber attacks because, as you know, the adversary is three types, script kits, uh, a commercial attacks, and military or state uh, uh, agents where they got unlimited budgets and unlimited resources, yes. and unlimited skills as well. Uh, so what are your views about the military element? And two is, do you ever see the commercial organizations ever overcoming this malice of cyber attacks? Mm -hmm. As much as I would love to say yes, I think we can. I, th I think that this, as the technology just continues to change, the adversaries are gonna continuously find ways to overcome it. And, and even if we keep up in the technological aspect, targeting the humans and how they behave, the attackers are gonna do that, social engineering. You know, if they can't achieve their objectives via the technology, they're gonna go after the users. And so, as much as I would love to say we'll solve it one day, I don't think we will. I think we're always going to be fighting them because they're always going to want to make money. There will always be people, military organizations, who need to get in and you know, achieve intelligence objectives or, you know, God forbid, during times of war, kinetic or non-kinetic means. As for the military side of things, yeah, I, I did avoid it a little bit um, because I always, I always, I never know what I'm allowed to talk about. 
from my, my past experiences. Um, but what I will say is that what I've seen in the government and then in the private sector, the attack patterns, the attack behaviors are often very similar because the tactics they try to achieve almost always align, right? Whether it's elevation of privileges or it's lateral movement or it's exfiltration of data. These are things they have to do in order to be successful. So if we can focus on that and look for the techniques inside of there, there may be techniques that are unique to the military or unique to nation state actors because of their budget and because of the time that they have. But a lot of that we will be able to detect across the spectrum of the attacks because they're all trying to achieve the same, the same sort of tactics. Their end state may be different, financially driven, you know, intelligence collection and gathering exploitation, but the tactics usually always fall within the same realm. It's the techniques that they employ that differ. Does that make sense? One of the things which has become apparent from a lot of the conversations that I've had over the past day, and hopefully continuing today as well, related to the threat intelligence and how we use that, some of the more advanced communities in terms of uh, malicious action are taking advantage of, for example, readily available toolies. And it could be argued that they're doing so to avoid attribution to some extent. So while the techniques are, as you rightly said, common, attribution becomes much more difficult if they're using common techniques. Is that a continuing problem, or is that an advantage that lets us target those common techniques? So um, my personal perspective, and hopefully you kind of saw it through, through the talk, is attribution is a government's game. I don't necessarily align with how we see attribution done in the private sector. For me, it's more about if I can do enough attribution to identify the intent and the capabilities, that's good enough. So, so to your point, um, I think that's why the attackers are doing that. They recognize we can't, you know, we're not going to be able to attribute to them if they're using a, a, a script that, or, a, or a kit that can be bought. But because that kit is developed by one person, or usually a small team of people, and it's employed across a wide set of targets, I think we can take advantage of that. I, I think the fact that the tool is the same, or even slight modifications, because humans are lazy, they're not going to change as many techniques. They only change the ones they have to. So if we continue to keep pace with that and look for those techniques, I think we'll stay ahead of that type of attack. That's a good question. Thank you.